as you see here, the, mess, the title of the message. You know, Tuesday this week was a special day. Tuesday night was not Halloween. I mean, it was Halloween, but that was not the most important event uh, in the whole world. It looks like it's the only event in the world, but there was another event that is much more significant for all of us than, than, than that. On October 31, 1517, 500 years ago to the day, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis on the castle church in Wittenberg in Germany, and that was the beginning of the Reformation. We are sitting here today in Lighthouse in Hong Kong, all of us from any country that w we come from. And the fact that we can worship Jesus Christ freely, understand the doctrine of salvation through Jesus Christ begins there. So that is an event that has changed the Western world, that has changed Christianity, that has changed all of our lives today. So I, I didn't want to bypass that. It's too important. I think in Europe they are much more uh, sensitive to this event and they will uh, uh, bring it more. And, but in many, many places it's just Halloween instead. So let's forget about Halloween and let's talk about what is really important for all of us. We need to understand a little bit to appreciate more fully uh, a bit of the, the social context and the, the sequence of events that uh, trigger this tremendous uh, reformation that uh, took place in the world. In the 15th and 16th centuries was a time of the Renaissance in, in Europe. Uh, after the Dark Ages, Europe was opening up in the areas of art, exploration, and uh, scientific discoveries. It was a, a time that has changed Western civilization for forever. So uh, at that time, why do we consider October 31? Because that's the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis in the Castle Church in Wittenberg. To protest uh, that at the church at the time, the relationship between God and man was reduced to money exchange. This was. And uh, so go back in time and remember something, and uh, this is really important. Like now we have Baptist church across the streets. How many church are on Hillwood Road and different church, Pentecostal church, Baptist church, uh, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, name it, they are there. At that time there was one church, only one, the Catholic church. And uh, there was not only the religious power, but it was also the political power. At that time, at one point in history, there were three popes fighting. The pope wanted the supremacy over the emperor of the states at that time. So the, the power, the authority that the pope had at the time, well, it's hard for us to understand now, because you even look at monarchy today and they have no power. But in those times, they had all the powers. People had been burned just, be, just a few years before that in Prague, John Oss has been burned because he was one of the early pre-reformers at the time. John Wycliffe also went through a martyrdom in England in a similar time, just following that. So it was a very dangerous to, to move out of the, under the umbrella that you were forced. There was no freedom of religion, no freedom of thinking. There was no education. People didn't know how to read in Germany in those years. Martin Luther is actually the one that has promoted education to, to, the, to the mass. Before him, there was none. It was none. There was, no, there was only the, a few of the wealthiest and uh, just a minority of the society that had some level of education. So imagine people didn't read, didn't know didn't have the Bible, all they had was the dogma that the Catholic Church was forcing them to believe. Uh, you, you have to, to go back there because that's, that's where we start. And uh, Martin Luther, what happened to him? He came from a very simple family. And uh, why I know so much about him is because I'm uh, listening to the life of Martin Luther this week because I thought it was too important an event to bypass, so I'm... I'm uh, I got an audio book and I'm really discovering this man, his teaching, his studies, uh, the, 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 the progress of his faith. It's like, wow, uh, I, I, it's really amazing. So anyway, uh, 
He was not from a wealthy family, but amazingly, he could uh, get a, a back at university and then a master's degree, and he was the pride of his family. He was going to law school. Wow, it was like, a, it was really, for a non-wealthy person at the time, it was like a big, big achievement. And then one day in July of uh, 1505, he wanted, in the midst of the semester, to go to his family for a visit, and he came into a super storm, and a lightning bolt just almost hit him and he got so scared that he prayed. Guess who he prayed to at the time? He had to go back to Catholic Church to understand. He prayed to Saint Anne. If you save me, Saint Anne, I'll be coming a monk. And she didn't save him, but God saved him. And then he became a monk. He just quit law school and his father was so disappointed and then he became a monk. Le he continued his studies. He became a, a priest, monk, which was very special. And he was uh, oppressed by the concept of the justice of God. And he was disturbed and he was angry at the justice of God because there was no way out. There was no way to escape the wrath of God and the justice of God. He was a monk, Augustinian monk, living in a monastery. And you know, sometimes he would confess his sin for six hours. Wow. How he was consumed by the fear of God's judgment. So, so that, that's the kind of background that he's coming from with a, a true heart desire. To, and he was angry at God's justice or the concept of his righteousness because he could not understand at the time. So at one point, and 15, 10, 11, he was sent in Rome to represent the Augustinian monk and to something. And then when he arrived there, it was like, oh, the super pilgrimage. This is the dream of my life. I'm going to Rome, the center of religion. I'm going to Rome. The Pope is there. This is like the, the big city of the time. And he was so disappointed by the, uh, what he saw. It was a filthy city. Urine was all over the place, on the streets you know, and everything. And there was corruptions among the Catholic. Even there were some priests who, because he was a really a devoted person, some priests were mocking him, mocking his devotion. So he was like really disappointed. So he went back, pursued more studies, then ended up in 1512 as a doctorate degree and then became a, a professor of theology at one of the famous universities in, in Germany. And his first book that he studied and taught was the book of Psalm. And the second one was Roman. Yes, now you know where we're going. And when we, he read Roman chapter 1, verse 17, and his life, his life was, was, was changed. He got the, the revelation of justification by faith. Can we change to that next slide? Yeah. For in the gospel, God's righteousness is being revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This has opened his heart, opened his mind, and he saw and understood God in a different way. And when it says, from faith to faith, if you look at the, the, the Greek dictionaries, from its origin point to its ending point, it's all about faith. It starts with faith, it goes by faith. The righteous will live by faith. And this is the discovery that he had made. Other issues that uh, Luther was concerned with is that at the time, in the Catholic Church, they were selling indulgences. That was the big deal. The Pope, uh, there were two Pope and successions that used that to rebuild the big uh, cathedral in Rome because it was falling apart and they needed more money to do that. So they were selling uh, indulgences to, to, re to rebuild. But it was also uh, doctrinally something that was a, a means to releasing people from the guilt of their sin and also their loved one. I think some of you have a Catholic background. You, 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 you know more about that. So uh, he started to preach against. He was not rebellious. He, was not, he didn't think to start a religion. Far from that. He just questioned. He just discovered the scriptures and he was just questioning. And in that time, these very highly intellectual people like him, the philosophers, the uh, intellectual and the theologians, they would um, call each other to debate. That was their way to examine the scriptures, to examine anything. So it was a common thing. When he nailed the, the 95 thesis to the door, it was not to protest and to, to start a riot. It was to call the theologian 
to come to debate this. And actually, the, the name of that uh, paper, uh, the academic paper, was Disputations on the Power and Efficiency of Indulgences. So it was just a disputation that he was looking to do. But the debate never took place because someone grabbed it, translated it, and also these things that was written in, in uh, uh, Latin. And only the very educated people knew Latin. So it was not, never intended to go to the people. He, he was really under the Pope. He was respectful of his religion. He was not trying to, to find a way out. He was just questioning, this is not right. Indulgences, what? It's like man-made uh, things to get uh, something. So let's discuss about that. But it was never brought to a disputation. Instead, it was translated in German. It was printed and it was sent all over uh, Germany and some copies went to Rome. So a few years later, Pope Leo commissioned Johann Tetzel to go around to make more money for Rome selling indulgences. And it led to a saying, he was a very good salesman, he was the best, that's why he was hi uh, hired by the, by, the, by the Pope. Listen to that. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So that was the, the, the saying uh, of the time. So let's look at some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the, the thesis, some of the points and the thesis. Because this is, you, you will understand what he is trying to do. He's not rebellious. He's just questioning and, and affirming based on this discovery of scripture. Number 21, indulgence will not save a man. The indulgence 22 say the same thing, but related to a dead, because an indulgence, you could buy an indulgence for a dead loved one. And then the Pope would have the uh, uh, divine authority to determine how much time he was granting to that dead person before he would leave purgatory. So that is how much uh, authority the Pope had was given to them. Verse 24, therefore most people are being deceived by indulgences. 27, it's nonsense to teach that a dead soul in purgatory can be saved by money. 32, people who believe that indulgences will let them live in salvation will be eternally damned along with those who teach it. So that's very serious. 33, do not believe those who say that the papal indulgence is a wonderful gift which allows salvation. 34, indulgences only offer men something which has been agreed by man. It's a man-made uh, concept. 75, it is wrong to think that papal pardons have the power to absolve all sin. Whoa, that's a dangerous one because now he's talking about the infallibility and the supreme authority of the Pope. And that makes him a target, an enemy, and his life became in danger. Later on, the Pope called him to come to Rome. A uh, promise were made, we will not touch you. But he did not believe it, and he didn't go to Rome. Uh, but he was under the protections of uh, Charles the Wise. Uh, he was uh, at the castle there and everything, and like some kind of a lord of the, some part of Germany. And he was protecting. Uh, Luther. Otherwise, Luther was, was dead at that time. It was really dangerous. So next slide, you will see the a summary of the, the thing. Selling indulgences to finance the building of St. Peter is wrong. The Pope has no power over purgatory. B buying indulgences gives people a false sense of security and endanger their salvation because they base their salvation on, on the fact that they purchased something instead of on Christ, so Christ is not there. So the significance of the Reformation is very important for us today, 500 years later, because otherwise, can you imagine living there, thinking like this, having no other thinking, no other truth, no other uh, principle of life, no freedom to, 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 to have a, use your mind and believe what the scriptures, no scriptures to indicate to you the truth. So the reformers were under that conviction that the church had drifted away. And they came to what we will not talk now about, we call it the five solas. The five solas are a Latin phrase to summarize the essential of Christianity uh, as followed this r reform, these reformers and their studies of scriptures and their rediscovery of God. 
So this, the five solas are here. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. The Bible alone is our highest authority. Sola fide, uh, faith alone. We are saved through faith alone in Christ Jesus. Sola gracia, grace alone. We are saved by the grace of God alone. Solus Christus, uh, Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone is our Lord, God, and Savior, King. Soli Deo Gloria, the, to the glory of God alone. We live for the glory of God alone. So that is the, the, the summary. This is the rediscovery. This is what you and I were supposed to have as a foundation because of the importance of the Reformation as to us. So let's talk about Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura emphasizes that the Bible alone is the source of authority for Christians. Is that what it is for you? I mean, we all say yes, but is it really? Haha, -ha, maybe not. And maybe by your actions and by your choices might not be the case. Uh, by saying scriptures alone, the reformers rejected the authority and the infallibility of the Roman Catholic Pope, which was a total um, <coughs> crime, if we can put it, punishable by death at the time. And they applied the infallibility to scriptures alone. So only on the Bible was the inspired. So anything that the Pope would come later on in traditions that would contradict the scriptures, they were rejected and it became a conflict. So Sola Scripture also fueled the translation of the Bible into German. You know, at one point after, a, a bit later, I, I'll go to that right now, on January 23, 1521, not only he had been uh, called by the Pope to come into a meeting to debate and to recant, after that, that, that was representing the religious authority. Later on, he was summoned by the emperor and a meeting called the Diet of Worms to recant his views. And now it was like, you disobey the emperor, you die. That, that's, that's his very serious, uh, very serious. He was really scared. So, he did not recant. So let's go to the next one. At this meeting, he was asked to confess, recant, or change. And this is what he said to them. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures. And he says, I don't, uh, I don't uh, rely upon the priest and the pope because they made so many errors in the past. Then he says, I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, I cannot, and I will not recant anything. May God help me. So that is how, what it means, so, sola scriptura. That is the truth. That is my conviction. This is what the Bible says. And I'm not recanting anything because what my conviction has become, it's all based on the testimony of scriptures. <coughs> so... At that time, it became very important. After this event, he was endangered of death. So the Charles V brought him and put him in a castle somewhere. It was like a prison, like it was like a, for his own protection. And he became very, very depressed there. There were birds coming there. He said that he was fighting the devil, that the devil was coming there. It was a really like a dark, dark time for him. But as he was going through this, this devastating time and he felt that he couldn't do anything, you know what he did? He translated the New Testament from original Greek into German in 11 weeks. That's how bright the man was. And he, he wrote many, many uh, pamphlets, uh, papers, essays that went all over Germany. And that has led to a revolt of the peasants because at that time there was a lot of poor people, uneducated people, and it, it was not Luther's um, intention to bring the peasants into revolt politically, but it did, because there were other preachers, friends with Luther, who went into extremes and applied differently, and it led to a big, big revolt of the peasants. So it, it turned the, the country almost into a uh, civil war at some point, but it was not uh, Martin Luther's. But anyway, it, he, he spoke to stop that. He came back to his place, and he, he kind of quieted down uh, th this revolt and everything, and they continued to, to teach the people. And from that time, he was excommunicated. 
there was a new church. There were a lot of people coming together, and there were also uh, cults coming. The Anabaptists came, and the Anabaptists, like, uh, really, because Martin Luther was still in, in the Catholic mentality, in a way. Those scriptures was liberating him. So he, he still had a lot of liturgy and a lot of things. So he was in a process of transformation and a process of change. So when the, the Anabaptists came, the Anabaptists were very, very Pentecostal people. They started to prophesy, and they went as far as says, we don't need the word of God anymore. We, God, is, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us directly. So there was all sorts of things happening at the same time. So the, the movement was almost out of control at, at one point, what uh, happened. So that is what happened. So Martin Luther progressively was kind of forming, forming a liturgy. Did you know that praise and worship in today's church is from Martin Luther. Yeah, I, I, this is I didn't know. He discovered the power of music. There was no singing. Even another reformer in Switzerland at the time, Zwingli, Zwingli says, it is sinful to have any musical instrument. We don't see it in the New Testament. So they had big debate on the will of man, the free will, or the sovereignty of God. It was a time of deep, deep questioning of the truth, the will of God, salvation, communion, the symbolism of communion, sub transubstantiation, consubstantiations, and uh, the, you know, the symbolism of, the, of communion. All of these were taking place at the same time. It was just developing. Uh, the, 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 the celibacy and the vows of the Christian, uh, the, the, the monks and the nuns at the time was questioned also. He was a monk, but he, he became by the scripture convinced that it was better to get married than not to be married. So he defended that. And at one point, there was a, a convent of, of nuns that came to him and wrote to him, can you help us? <laughs> we want to get out of here. Like the one who became his, his wife, Catherine, was put in a convent when she was a child. At 16 years old, they made the vow to become a nun. But later on, through this discovery of the scriptures, they started to, to want a, a way out. So Martin Luther made a group of these ladies escape and uh, empty barrels of, I don't know if it is olive oil or whatever it is. So they escaped during the night and they were brought somewhere to be protected. Because at that time, imagine, you, you need to understand the time. There was no protection for women. There was no education. There was no work. There was, if you were not married, you, you, you were nothing. So you needed to be protected. So they protected these women and they found husband for them. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, these are things that happen in the time. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Anyway, so Martin Luther did so many things, and he discovered, and to all of that, the power of music. He, he, he wrote for the priesthood of all believers that laity should have scriptures preached in the heart language of the mother tongue, and songs of praise should be on their lips. Music is a useful tool to teach not only ce celebratory, just for celebrating, but also educational in nature. Because the people at the time were, were not educated. Even though the, the Bible had just freshly translated in German, they could not read it. So how are they going to be impacted by the scriptures? Through singing the song. So Martin Luther became a writer of hymns and songs and wonderful, wonderful. Go online and check the Our Father from Martin Luther. Read this. It will become one of your favorite prayers. It is so deep. It is so rich. A mighty fortress uh, uh, is also from him and many, uh, many others. So he used the power of music to educate the people in the Word of God, help them to memorize, help them to understand the scriptures. It was a wonderful time of discovery at the time. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we benefit from 500 years ago. Today, we, we live it and we don't even know where it comes from and we cannot fully appreciate it. Sola fide and sola gracia. The Roman Catholic Church of the time emphasized the buying of indulgences, doing good works, venerating and buying relics. They had relics of Jesus' cross, relics of Jesus' 
boat, of Jesus' clothes, of St. Peter's, this, and they had relics of everything. And they were taught and believed that they needed all of these things to, to have a, a salvation. Sola fide, only by faith. Salvation is only by faith. Luther understood the Bible. The term righteousness became uh, w w with a new mean meaning. Go to the next slide over there. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The same text, word for word, is found in Galatians and Genesis. It is so clear. It is credited, it is imputed, God put it on your account by faith. So that became so important and he discovered how the church had corrupted its practice. The doctrine of justification became the chief object of the whole of Christian uh, doctrines for Martin Luther. He says, if this stands, the church stands. If it falls, the church falls. That doctrines of justification. The chief truth is this. Jesus Christ, our Lord, died for our sins, was raised again for justification. So imagine in the time what a great revelation it was. And at the same time, many other reformers in, in Switzerland and France and different places and, and, uh, were discovering. He alone, next slide, he alone, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was show, to show God's righteousness. By faith only. Faith alone justifies. The act that God declares a sinner righteous. Sola gratia emphasize grace as a basis for salvation. This is, I think, something we need to rediscover more. Uh, it's, 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 it's big. Because the, 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 the term grace, the songs we sang today on grace, the, 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 the meaning of the word grace today is not the same as what we are going to discuss over here. As humans, we inherited from our ancestor Adam a nature that is enslaved to sin. So you're enslaved to sin. So if you're enslaved, you cannot break out. You don't have the authority. You don't have the, the means to, to free yourself. Because of our nature, we were naturally enemies of God. How can we stand before God then? Only by His grace as He mercifully attributes to us the righteousness. In other words, salvation comes from what God does, not what we can do. Actually, we have nothing to show. We have nothing to, 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 to buy. We, we, we have nothing for that. So the life, the perfect life of Jesus Christ is counted as ours. Our records of sin and failure were counted to Jesus when he died on the cross. And this is very well explained in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. But I think we need to rediscover when it says, For by grace you have been saved. It's not the cheap grace that we sing about, that we hear about today, that is almost a license to live, you know, anything. The grace of God is that we, we were perishing. We were enemies of God. And while we were yet in our sins, while we had nothing to show forth, a pure gift of the mercy of God is offered to us without us showing, deserving, having anything to show for it. Just grace, pure grace, mercy of God that, that, that he reached out to us. We were in sin, and he gave us the gifts of grace. So that is how powerful the term grace is. Solus Christus is absolutely so important, true Christ alone. It emphasized Jesus and the salvation. Again, the Roman Catholic had uh, substituted in their traditions priests and the role of mediators. You want to communicate to God? You go to the priest. You go to confessions. You buy something. You do something. But solus Christus is not that. Solus Christus is not only, oh, look, Christ is our great servant. Oh, Christ is our great example. Oh, let's follow Christ. It's not even that. But Solus Christus is Christ the Lamb of God. 
Christ, the great substitute for sinners, whose death and life satisfied divine justice on our behalf. This is, this is a concept that talks about propitiation. I, I want to stop a little bit over here because I, I, I will read something to you that I've seen from a pastor that some of you know here, I will not name anything, who wrote in his Facebook, and that's re greatly trouble me because I see it r repeatedly in modern Christians and modern generations like each generation thinks oh we are so much smarter than the previous generation oh they didn't know we know better we interpret better so this is you remember the book many of you have heard the uh, Jonathan Edwards book sinners in the hands of an angry God well think about it we live in 2017 so somebody is better than that We'll write another book, The Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, which is a very good title, is very good, except what some of the concept inside. So I'm questioning that. It says, why are people boasting of their intellect, intellectual ability to, to, oh, we know better, we understand it. It's not really what it means before. What Martin Luther and all the reformers and all the, the great theologians of the past, everything that has been fought for, people died for, the, what the scriptures itself literally write in the Bible, it's not really what it means. We found something much, much wiser. Listen, listen to that. In this book, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving Good, the writer shares with us pilgrims, why Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was not a payment to God, and how thinking it has been skewing Christians' view of the Father for years. So I'm confused now, because it says, this is, was not a payment, but here I'm reading, this is the only, solus Christus, it's the payment, it's the Lamb of God, it's the blood of Jesus, it's the sacrifice of Jesus. Actually, the Bible cannot put it more clearly, read the Leviticus, read Exodus, the sacrifice, the Passover, the sacrifice, uh, Leviticus, all the sacrifice, the high priest, all of this, read Hebrew, and read First John, how do you know that God loves you? This is how we know that God loves us, he has sent his son as a propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world, propitiation, or sacrifice of atonement. He had to pay to satisfy the justice of God, the, the anger of God. And this new generation, that's what they're thinking, says, oh, if we present to the world an angry God or a God of justice, we are go not going to appeal. We need to present only the good side of God, the coolness of God. The, the, the openness of God, the gracious God, and all this. So let's not talk about propitiation. Propitiation means, no, that's not this. In the propitiation, you see the love of God much more. Because you see your impossibility and your slavery to sin and impossible to break through. That's why Martin Luther was, was confessing for six hours. He was angry and confused about the justice of God. Who can set us free from that bondage of sin? Who will make me right before God? What can I do to be right with God? And God says, you have nothing to do. You don't have to buy anything. You have nothing to prove. It's a pure gift of grace. It's given to you for free. You just have to believe in what Jesus has done. So why are people writing, oh, this is not what it meant. It means something else instead. There's more. From there, we move to chatting about hell. And while Jesus did speak a fair bit about hell, he suggests what he was referring to was not an afterlife torture chamber, but rather the consequences, the hell that we we'll unleash on ourselves and the world around us when we fail to walk in, in a way. So hell is not really hell. Oh, yes, Jesus talked about hell, but Jesus didn't really mean about hell. It's not hell. It's the mess up of our own life. We mess up, so that's, that's the life. I know old people in my, in, my, in my province, that is what we are seeing. Hell is what we're made of. It's the misery and all the things that we suffer for. It's not true, but this is part of that book also, representing the modern philosophy that is spread in so many churches. And then he says, we wrapped our time with Brian 
as he shared a bit on what the book of Revelation is really trying to tell us. It wasn't what we were told in church growing up. Again, book of Revelation is not really what the church has done. Whatever you've learned in the church from your pastors, from the time, from the theology of the past, it's not really important. This is what we believe now. It's better. We, we are wiser. We understand scriptures. So that's why. Why is the Reformation so important? Because, that, like he said, Martin Luther says, if, if it falls, we fall. If it stands, we stand. If our foundation stands, if our justification, if our understanding of salvation is, it is important. Let's go to the next slide and we'll finish. For a while I was with you, I resolved nothing except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and him crucified. Why was Paul so cr crucified oriented? To me, it touch, I, I'm, I'm touched, and I, I need to, to review a lot of, of, of what we, we, we teach and all of this. Today, Christianity is so much a recipe for health, wealth, success, get good families, economic prosperity. If you want to have drug-free children, do this, do that, uh, you know, follow Jesus, everything will be fine, everything will be cool. Yes, these are byproducts. Live with God. Everything will be better supposedly, uh, in some ways, you will improve your morality, you will improve your decision making, you will improve a lot of things, even your, your spending money lifestyle, you will improve a lot of things because there's so much wisdom in God. But that's not the core essence, truth of, of the Reformation. And the last point, I'm skipping a bit because of time, soli deo gloria. Glory belongs to God alone. God's glory is the central reason for salvation. Why are you saved? To make your life better? To improve your life? No. This is also a byproduct. Of course, it will come. It will help you. It will smoothen the path uh, that you are going. It will smooth the mountain. It will make path your straight. The, your light will shine like the day uh, will come. Follow God. It's a wonderful byproduct. But the glory of God is the central reason for salvation. Why does he save you? Why does he want you? He wants to conform you to the image of his son. He wants to bring you to glory, justify those that he has justified. He will glorify also. God is not a means to an end. Like, oh, walk with God and you will get this. It's not a means to an end. He is the means and he is the end. God is the end. Our focus is on God. The reformers call this doctrine, the soli deo gloria, the doctrine of vocation. In other words, when you look at your life, your work, and all the roles that you play in your life, is your calling. You are called to the glory of God and everything that you do. you 24 hours, 7, everything that you do, everything in your life is the doctrine of vocation. So we need, I think, to reform a lot of our uh, modern uh, ideology on church and, and, and everything. In the last slide, what is it to be an heir of the reformation? We see here a quotation. What is it to be an heir of the Reformation? It is to look outward to Christ bleeding and dying on the cross, a great rescuer of sinners of me. That's the topic. Christianity is Christ. Christ crucified. And, and all of these, these sola that, that 